I found a positive moment in the fact that I had to attend a party at my wife's office, the opportunity to drive my challenger in nature. But the downside was that the faster I pressed the pedal, the quicker I reached the company cottage. There was a flat 20-meter stretch of road ahead devoid of any obstacles like stop signs or traffic lights, and my Dodge was free to demonstrate its power. But due to the lack of gas stations and shops, I had to ensure that there was enough fuel for the entire trip. Since our daughters got married, Donna and I have been growing apart. I had hoped that this new chapter in our lives would bring us closer together, but it seems that everything turned out the other way around. Despite my reluctance, Donna insisted that I accompany her to an event that she had previously attended alone. She was a drinker and a socialite, while I preferred to keep a low profile and only occasionally took a sip of beer. Over the past year, I had begun to suspect that she was having an affair, but at the moment, the situation seemed indifferent to me. I think that was one of the reasons we were drifting apart. I was patiently waiting for the opportunity to leave a relationship that had become unpleasant to me. I was looking for a way to end my marriage. I must admit that I may have been the catalyst for my wife's decision to leave. I have always been a minimalist, which is explained by my upbringing in a family that was experiencing financial difficulties. My brothers and I had much less than our peers. No bicycles, no toys, no pets, no fancy gadgets. It seemed to me that I led a lifestyle similar to the Amish, but without religious beliefs. I was not naive and understood how society works, but I could not bring myself to fully accept it. I understood how important it was not to get into debt, pay bills on time, and save money for the future. Living in a minimalist style did not require fanaticism but rather self-discipline. By allowing myself a little luxury, I was able to fit into society while maintaining my principles. Most of all, I love my marriage and family. It wasn't easy to find a partner who could tolerate my quirks and accept my uniqueness, but I found her in Donna. She came from a similar background and understood the value of a frugal lifestyle, although she did not fully embrace it as I did. As our marriage progressed, I noticed that Donna was becoming more accustomed to a more average lifestyle, which I found difficult to accept. But with the arrival of our daughters, I began to understand how our priorities and actions had changed to better fit into society. We decided to purchase a modest house and update our wardrobe. Donna began to pay more attention to her appearance, regularly doing hairstyles and improving her self-care and makeup skills. We also purchased two smartphones of a more expensive model. When our daughters grew up, Donna got a minimum paid office job that required transportation. We bought her a small Honda Civic that fit into our budget. Her salary covered the cost of the car, lunches, and new clothes needed for work. Although it was a simple job, I was happy with it. My name is William Smith, the most common name. I work as a disassembler for a company that manufactures industrial compressors. The work can be monotonous, but I find satisfaction in it. Despite being offered a promotion, I turned it down without informing my wife, Donna. Another secret I kept from her was my decision to save money for retirement. Whenever possible, I bought an ounce of gold. There are more than 30 of them in my basement safe, and I was just getting started. My last expense was a Dodge Challenger, a gift from my late older brother, John, who tragically died while working on an offshore oil platform. I really treasure the car that he left me in his will, despite the huge insurance costs. Donna has achieved success in her career at Gilbert Industrial. It seems like you've included a large chunk of text that needs correction. Here's the revised version. She was constantly promoted, and in her first year, she often talked about her job. Over time, her conversations about work and colleagues became rare. I felt a shift, but I couldn't determine its cause. In the hope of clarifying the situation, I expected a company retreat to be held this evening. The weekend event seemed like an obligation to me, and I felt out of place. I had run into her colleagues before, but I didn't like any of them. When I got on the freeway at Holbrook, I was looking forward to speeding up. Donna reacted the way I expected. She was unhappy with the speed but chose to remain silent. Yes, I did exceed the speed limit, and no, it didn't bother me. Bill, why are you in such a hurry? We have enough time to get to our destination. Could you slow down a bit? She said with concern in her voice. I'm not in a hurry. You know, I didn't want to go there at all. I'm just taking this opportunity to give the engine a good run. 
It's important that it works without interruptions, I replied irritably. Please don't spoil my mood. This weekend is extremely important for my career. Donna asked, Mrs. Simpson emphasized the importance of your presence at the corporate event as the wife of company president Glenn Robertson Simpson. She was well aware of the old capitals and traditions that surrounded the business. She explained that it is extremely important for you to fully understand my new role in the company in order to provide me with the necessary support. If you have any questions, Mrs. Simpson will be able to clarify them at the event. Donna explained the meaning of my presence at the event. I have constantly supported you in the past. What has changed now? I asked. With my new role, I have a lot of responsibilities. Marge advised me to introduce you to them gradually so that you can fully understand them. It may not be easy for you at first, but she guaranteed that in time you will understand everything, Donna replied. When we arrived at the cottage, my excitement grew. Donna's message was very clear, this weekend is going to be intriguing. Upon arrival, Donna headed to the cottage, leaving me to carry the bags. I felt a sense of humility wash over me when Toby Wallace, the company's assistant officer, praised my car. Hey, nice wheels, Mr. Smith. What year is she, 70 or 71, he asked. I replied, this is the 70s. Then Toby introduced me to his wife, Bonnie, who was sitting with him on the porch. Looking around, I noticed that most of the guests had already gone inside, leaving only a few cars and an old battered car at the end of the queue in the parking lot. We spent the next five minutes discussing my car. Why are you outside? Why aren't you and Bonnie inside with everyone else? I asked. It's not really our company, Toby replied. We were going to leave early, but Mrs. Simpson insisted that we stay. We came early to help set everything up, and the caterers have already left, so we're here, he added. I looked at them in a puzzled way and asked, you have to explain to me what's going on. Toby hesitated, not knowing what to do. I don't want to upset you, but it seems to me that something suspicious is going on, possibly related to your wife, he said. Will you stay all weekend? I asked. No. That's why I parked my car on the side of the road so I could easily drive away, Toby replied. The situation was getting more intriguing by the minute. I need to take my things to our room. Just let me know when you're leaving, okay? I asked. Of course, Mr. Smith. Please be careful. Don't make stupid decisions, Toby warned. Fortunately, I only had two small bags. When Mrs. Simpson came in, she noticed me, smiled, and waved. Donna stood impatiently at the top of the stairs, clearly annoyed that I had taken so long. It's about time, Bill, she grumbled. We only have a few hours to prepare for the evening. Get yourself cleaned up and put on something beautiful. Tonight is special, and I want everything to be perfect. After receiving instructions, Donna informed me that she would go for a leisurely walk around the grounds to relax before our evening plans. When she left the room grinning, I couldn't help but notice a slight coolness in the air, which made my own walk even more enjoyable. In total, 16 cars lined up in a row, mostly Mercedes, as well as several Jaguars and Lexuses. Surprisingly, four of them had numbers from other states on them. Watching luxury cars, I felt out of place, wondering how my wife could be among such a high-class company. Something was wrong when I noticed Toby and Bonnie loading things into their truck. I waved at them and went over to start a conversation. It looks like Mrs. Simpson has finally given you the green light to leave, I remarked. I'm not very comfortable here, Mr. Smith, Toby said. Toby and I are kind of sneaking out, Bonnie said. Bonnie offered to stay, but I convinced her otherwise. Could you do me a favor and stay until the evening buffet is over? I'm a little worried, and I'll be grateful for the company, I asked. I have no idea what's going on, but I have a bad feeling, Bonnie said quietly. Great minds think the same way, don't they, Bonnie? I said. She blushed at my feeble attempt at a joke. I think you should stay. There are crabs and oysters in the queue to serve, I said. I started to think that I really liked Toby. Reluctantly, I dressed as my wife insisted. As we were heading to the buffet, the hostess suddenly took my hand and led me to a secluded corner. 
she expressed gratitude for our presence at the event in support of Donna, stressing the importance of our continued support for her career growth. She mentioned that the compensation package for the new position is quite substantial and assured me that I would be satisfied. Curious, I asked what role she was talking about since Donna spoke about it somewhat vaguely. It seemed to me that she had gone off topic. When I tried to get the details out of her, she usually didn't bring me up to date and told me to wait for now. I explained my questions. Don't worry, William. I think she just wants to surprise you, Mrs. Simpson replied. You haven't answered my question, I repeated. She has no official position. I suppose you can call her a personal assistant, she replied evasively. I understand, I nodded. The buffet looks delicious, Mrs. Simpson said, changing the subject. Thanks for the clarification, Mrs. Simpson, I thanked her. Please call me Marge, she replied with a smile. While Donna was chatting with the VIPs, I tried a little of everything that was on the buffet. Just as I was finishing the tasting, Mrs. Simpson came up to me. William, Donna mentioned that you came here today in your sports car, she said. Could you do us a favor and get some alcohol quickly? I gladly agreed, and she informed me that there were several cases of wine waiting for me at the store in Holbrook, and all of them had already been paid for. She assured me that there shouldn't be any problems, but that I should call her if there were any problems and take my phone with me. I gladly agreed to this assignment. I'll let Donna know, and then I'll go, I replied. As she was leaving, I caught Toby's eye and asked him to meet me outside in five minutes. Donna just smiled when I told her about Mrs. Simpson's request for help and reminded me not to forget my phone. It was intriguing how they both emphasized the same thing. Toby, I have a request for you, I said, throwing in the car keys. Are you serious? He asked. Please go to Holbrook and pick up some wine for Mrs. Simpson at the store. I have a suspicion that the reason for the delay may be some kind of problem. Did you catch my thought? I said confidentially. Toby grinned and agreed. Here's my phone. Just put it in the car. If it rings, don't pick up the phone, and whatever you do, don't turn it off. Any questions? I asked. How long should we be gone? Toby asked. At least two hours, and before returning to the cottage, fill up with gasoline. Have fun, I said. It was a little chilly outside, but fortunately, I had the sense to put on a cozy jacket. Now all that remained was to wait and watch from various vantage points located on the back porch. Most of the interior of the house was visible. I settled down in a cozy place where I could watch without attracting attention. Donna seemed to be the center of everyone's attention, although I still didn't understand why. Her radiant smile, infectious laughter, and ease of communication gave her the look of a celebrity. About 20 minutes later, Mrs. Simpson and Donna huddled together, intently examining Donna's cell phone. I immediately understood their intentions, they were checking my location. Thanks to Toby, I was already closer to Holbrook. Mrs. Simpson smiled and raised her hand to speak, but I couldn't hear her words. The room seemed to fill with quiet approval, almost like barely audible applause. Glenn Roberts and Simpson walked over to Donna and took her hand as they walked up the main staircase. They stopped, raising their joined hands in a victorious gesture, and then laughed as they climbed the stairs. The hall was filled with applause. There was still an hour and a half left before my car returned, and I decided to enjoy the moment. My trusty pocket knife, a cherished gift from my daughters ten years ago, has always been by my side. The sharp edge and durable steel made it an ideal tool for this job. After looking around the neighborhood, I focused on the cars that were closest to the house. Taking my time, I carefully removed each valve stem and put it in my jacket pocket. There was no hurry, I was in control. I didn't want to leave anything superfluous, and I certainly didn't want to leave a mess on the Simpsons Road. I had to deal with 16 machines and 64 valve rods, and I had about an hour left to do everything. About four cars were locked, but all the others were open, so I started collecting registration sheets from each of them, starting with the car closest to the cabin. Some of the forms were tucked into visors, others were stored in glove boxes. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with them, but I figured they might be useful in the future. While I was working, I realized that Toby was still 30 minutes away from returning, and I had enough time to finish what I started. 
I decided to remove the pads from the spare tires. Thanks to the easy access to the cars, I was able to get to the trunks where I found 10 more valve rods. There were no spare tires on the two cars at all. Although I understood that my actions were petty and immature, they still brought me a small sense of satisfaction. I preferred to avoid conflicts, so all my actions were designed to be inconspicuous and secretive. I didn't feel insecure about myself, so I had no desire to seem cool or heroic. I allowed all alpha males to take on this role. Twenty minutes later, my car returned. Toby and Bonnie seemed to have a good time during the trip. He confirmed my suspicions that there was a delay in the store, which seemed to have been planned in advance. While they were gone, no one called my phone, so I turned it off and took out my SIM card. They couldn't wait to leave, so I thanked Toby, wished him a safe journey, and advised him to start looking for a new job as soon as possible. I knew that the crates of wine in the trunk were most likely very expensive, but it was a simple matter to solve this problem. I put all three boxes on the porch of the cottage to avoid accusations of theft. The road home was calm because there was nothing valuable left in the house, only personal documents, a laptop, and my gold. At first, I thought of burning down the house before leaving, but I didn't want to make a martyr out of Donna. Two hours later, I was on the road again. I didn't see the need to leave an ordinary note or an engagement ring, I figured she'd figure it out on her own. I spent two days driving unnecessarily and without purpose. On Monday morning, I called work and quit, asking that my last paycheck be sent home to my parents in Carlisle. They were disappointed that I left without warning, and although I apologized, I did not explain the reason. I was reading a local newspaper for merchandisers and came across an interesting job advertisement at a nearby supermarket. They needed a man to work the night shift, taking goods off the shelves from 10 o'clock in the evening to 6 o'clock in the morning. Intrigued, I decided to go to the store after breakfast. It was located in a quaint old part of Chattanooga where charming craftsmen houses and many mobile homes stood. Driving through the area for the next hour, I couldn't help but imagine myself living in one of these cozy cottages. Although I was hoping for more upscale housing, while on the street, I came across an ad for renting an apartment in a garage. Although I hadn't studied the housing market yet, I didn't want to miss this opportunity. The rental price did not include a garage, offering an additional $50 a month. I was able to rent an apartment. It was a cozy room with one bedroom, a bathroom, and basic furniture, a bed, a chest of drawers, a table, and chairs. Despite the bathroom situation, the price and location were perfect, so I decided to move and decide the rest later. At least now I had a place I could call home. There was a unique situation in the supermarket. There were many applicants, but not so many that you could safely leave them alone at night. I spoke frankly with the owner, and eventually, the deal was done. When I offered to work informally without benefits and for a dollar less than they wanted, surprisingly, they didn't even ask for my social security number. Work was a 10-minute walk from my apartment, so I spent the rest of the day settling into my new home. Both sides were satisfied with the agreement reached. The owner kindly provided me with his internet access code, for which I am very grateful to him. I went to the nearest Goodwill store and bought kitchen utensils and a small microwave oven. In addition, I bought bed linen and cleaning products. In the evening, I decided to cancel my life insurance policy. I decided not to interfere with the operation of my bank and credit cards. After all, what harm could it do? Since both of our daughters are now married, my departure has become somewhat easier, although we didn't have any grandchildren yet. I was sure they would be coming soon. I contacted my daughter Laura to share the news. I contacted Edder to assure her that I was fine and asked her to be by her mother's side if she needed help. Laura knew I wasn't there, but Donna didn't tell me the details. She promised to keep her sister Linda informed. I deleted all missed calls from my wife and turned off the phone again. The thought flashed through my mind that I needed to take a shower, maybe tomorrow. Everything has not been finalized yet. I needed to find a safe place for my gold. It may not be valuable to others, but it was very important to me. I bought a safe in Huntsville, Alabama, thinking they wouldn't be able to track me in Chattanooga. But my assumptions turned out to be wrong. Despite this, I felt a sense of relief knowing that I had made an attempt to protect myself. It took almost two hours to get to Huntsville, but I didn't mind. I took additional precautions. 
I installed a new latch and a heavy-duty lock on the garage door in my apartment to ensure the safety of my belongings. Mastering the new job went smoothly. A colleague helped me for the first three nights. When they left, I was left alone with myself. I wasn't required to help in the grocery or meat departments, but the frozen food department turned out to be the most difficult. But after a couple of weeks, I got over it. To solve the dilemma with the shower, I signed up for a subscription to Planet Fitness, paying only $20 in advance and $10 monthly. The only downside was that I had to provide my credit card information. I had to drive to Huntsville to get a credit card from a new bank, and I realized how difficult it is to completely disconnect from the network. I realized that something needed to be changed. I wasn't sure how determined Donna would be to look for me, or if she would at all, but I decided to put this problem aside for now and deal with it when the time comes. I soon mastered the daily routine. My shift started at 10 o'clock in the evening and ended at 6 o'clock in the morning. To get to Planet Fitness, I had to either run fast for 20 minutes or walk leisurely for 30 minutes. Initially, I signed up for the gym just to have access to showers, but over time, I discovered that I also used various exercise machines. I devoted almost two hours to working out in the gym every day. Not only did I notice improvements in my physical health and weight loss, but I also felt a sense of accomplishment. Although I never considered myself to be overweight, I struggled with flabbiness, and I was pleased to see it decrease. Returning to constant physical activity brought me a new sense of well-being. I found a comfortable rhythm at work and really enjoyed my duties. Despite the repetitive nature of my work, there was a sense of novelty in it that I found intriguing. I was able to focus on my work without constant interference, which allowed me to do my job perfectly. The gym also became a great choice for me and helped me achieve my fitness goals. I quickly determined which exercises I liked the most and which ones were better to skip. Heavy weights didn't bring me joy, so I avoided them. Daily runs to the gym made treadmills unattractive. My daily routine started with a workout that lasted 30 minutes. Then I would spend 20 minutes on a rolling machine, 20 minutes on a ladder stepper, and end up with 20 minutes on a vertical exercise spike. I wasn't interested in the TV. As a result, I bought a used desktop computer with a large monitor. Watching YouTube videos became my usual source of entertainment. I didn't know how to cook, but I noticed a change in my eating habits. Unknowingly, I found myself gravitating towards the keto diet. In combination with an irregular work schedule, I involuntarily began to include intermittent fasting in my daily routine. After three months, I started to feel healthier and lost a few pounds. Feeling confident in myself, I decided to turn to my daughters again. This time I dialed Linda's number. Hello, I greeted her. Hello, I finally heard from you. We were all worried. Are you okay? Linda asked happily. Yes, everything is fine. Don't worry about me. I'll handle it myself. I'm just calling to see how your mom is doing, I asked. Actually, she's doing very well. She got a promotion at work and loves her job, although she's very upset about you. She mentioned that you dumped her at a party and ran away from home like an offended child. Those were her exact words, Linda said. I cannot confirm or deny this statement until she decides to reveal the truth, I replied. She mentioned that finances are a little strained without your participation, but her recent promotion has made the situation a little easier, Linda shared. I am sincerely happy for her. Did she give any details about her new position? I asked. Only that she began to earn more and she had the opportunity to travel often, Linda replied with a sigh. I remained silent. After a while, Linda spoke again. Are you planning on coming home for Christmas? I don't think so, I replied. I'll try to send something for you and Laura, I said. To be honest, we don't need or want anything, Dad. We would prefer you to be here with us, the daughter said sadly. I'm sorry, but I have to go. Please give my regards to Laura. Bye, I said and hung up. Feeling a little depressed, I couldn't help feeling that my daughters didn't fully understand the situation and blamed me for all the problems. It bothered me, but I didn't feel the need to justify myself. It was obvious that my wife had no remorse, and I couldn't get rid of the feeling of bitterness creeping into my soul. According to my daughter, Donna was fine without me. 
I couldn't understand why she insisted on my presence at home. Feeling depressed, I finished a case of beer and spent the weekend thinking. My alcohol consumption was increasing, but over time, the situation began to change. I was doing a good job and got an unexpected pay raise. I gained more freedom in my role and quickly rebuilt the replenishment system, making significant improvements. I provide a weekly report to help determine stock levels and order intervals, which the store finds useful. Despite the efficient computer system it already has, my housing situation was completely in line with my needs and was affordable. I was losing weight and gaining muscle mass, and under certain lighting conditions, I even started to have ABS. I stopped shaving and now wore my hair long enough to tie it in a small ponytail. My overall appearance has been transformed, becoming a little more intimidating. Classes at the gym became more comfortable and I began to spend more time there. Surprisingly, I started making acquaintances with the gym goers. They were acquaintances rather than friends. I was careful with enthusiastic women to avoid misunderstandings, but it was a lot of fun with the guys. We made fun of each other. One unexpected friendship arose with a woman named Harriet, or at least that's what everyone called her. She was known for her aloof demeanor and rarely entered into conversations with others, but I seemed to be the only exception to this rule. Every morning, without ceasing, she diligently practiced for at least two hours. Her classes were far from the usual yoga exercises, they were intense and purposeful. As far as I could tell, she looked about 40 years old, had a stern look, and a wardrobe consisting exclusively of sweatpants and hoodies. While other women at the gym flaunted their toned bodies in tight, revealing outfits, she stood out for her more modest clothes. Even though I was teased for being the only man she talked to, I couldn't help but feel intrigued towards this mysterious woman. I did not actively support her, but I did not reject her in any way. I must admit I felt a little flattered. Time has passed, and I have not addressed either my daughters or my wife. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Instead, I focused on replenishing my gold coin collection with trips to Huntsville. But then the situation started to change. William, can I talk to you for a minute? The fact that Harriet called me by my full name was unusual because everyone else called me Bill. It made me stop and think. She had never addressed me by my first name before, so it was a surprise to me. Can I help you with something? We both found a bench and made ourselves comfortable. I have a corporate event on Friday evening, and I need an escort, she explained. I will take care of all expenses and provide transportation because I know that you do not drive a car. If necessary, I can also compensate you for the expenses. I hesitated, and she immediately took my hand. I'm sorry, maybe I did something or said something that upset you, she asked. No, not at all. It's just that there are some things in my past that I need to sort out, I replied. If you want to talk to me about this, I will be happy to help you. What exactly is the problem, she asked. Well, for starters, I'm married, I admitted with a sigh. Oh, I didn't know you were married. It probably complicates everything, she said thoughtfully. Not necessarily. I just wanted to be blunt. I haven't spoken to my wife in nine months, so I'm not even sure we're still married, I replied. Have you initiated legal proceedings regarding divorce or separation, she asked. No, I did not initiate it. Besides, I don't have the right outfit for going out. I don't have a suit, a jacket, a shirt, or even ordinary shoes since I don't need these things. I don't have them, I confessed sheepishly. Well, it's not a problem. I can arrange their purchase. I will resolve this issue a week before the meeting so that everything is in order, Harriet assured me. Despite the fact that I work at night, I think I can provide myself with a day off without much difficulty. I agreed with her request. I am so grateful to you for solving this problem, she exclaimed with a smile, expressing her satisfaction. Is there anything else I should pay attention to? Maybe I should shave before the event? I asked sincerely. William, I admire your beard and hair, but I must admit that you could use a little grooming. Would you mind if my stylist looked at you on Friday afternoon? Harriet offered with a smile. I reluctantly agreed, and so began my professional relationship with Harriet. The following Tuesday, I found myself in an institution of a slightly higher class than the one I was used to. 
Harriet had arranged my visit in advance, and I ended up leaving with two pairs of trousers and two jackets. The outfit was complemented by a pair of shirts and several ties. I took it one step further by adding two turtlenecks, which I always liked and thought went well with jackets. Harriet had already taken care of the payment. On the way back, I stopped and bought a new pair of high-quality shoes and underwear. Losing weight meant I needed new underwear, and the loafer-style shoes I chose were both stylish and elegant. My meeting with the stylist on Friday was successful. The stylist was friendly and experienced, which made the meeting enjoyable. He left me with a neatly trimmed beard and turned my tail into a short modified mullet. I do not know exactly what this hairstyle is called, but it was longer at the back. He assured me that it would be easier to maintain my hairstyle this way, and I really like the new look. He didn't say anything about Harriet, but he mentioned that I was lucky. At 6 o'clock sharp, Harriet drove up to my apartment. She stayed in the car and only honked briefly. Her Lexus seemed out of place in my neighborhood. I chose a gray jacket and a turtleneck, feeling confident in my appearance. Harry, before we go inside, could you clarify what I should or shouldn't do tonight? I asked. The first hour will most likely be spent on small talk. You don't need to take any part in this. Many of those present will turn out to be pretentious snobs that you better stay away from. If possible, avoid them. My main request is for you to stay close to me and block out unwanted attention. Just try to do it discreetly, she asked. Make sure that you always have a drink at hand, whether it's ginger ale or mineral water. Stay friendly and pleasant in communication and never lose your temper. Remember that you are here as my boyfriend, so make them believe that we are a couple. Although I've never seen myself in this role, I'm willing to give it a try. Do you think you can handle it? Harry asked, turning her head to me. Absolutely, I replied. And don't worry, there will be food in an hour. We will get a rubber chicken on a plate and listen to some speeches, she said with a laugh. After that, there will be more communication and exchange of compliments. By the way, you look amazing, she remarked, winking at me. Then I noticed that I hadn't paid her a single compliment about her dress or hairstyle. I felt a little out of place. The beginning of the evening unfolded exactly as she described. My role turned out to be easier than expected. The hall was filled with single men in fancy suits and flashy watches. Harry looked amazing, and many of them knew that she was single. Many of them were not averse to starting a conversation with her. They assessed her interest, checked how interested she was. I couldn't resist giving them a suspicious look that reminded me of Charles Bronson. Surprisingly, it was effective. Every time I left to get her a drink, another one quickly came to take my place. Some of them even brought her drinks, which she discreetly passed to me. Harry looked at me several times and smiled faintly. Finally, we were able to sit down at the table. When suddenly, 300 plates of chicken appeared out of nowhere. The dish on my plate was really disappointing. Although I usually don't find fault with food, this dish disappointed me. Looking at it, I couldn't help but think about the money I had just spent. Harry leaned over to me and asked, Will, do you want to leave here? She tried to speak with an accent like Bogart's, but it didn't work out. Without saying a word, I stood up, took her hand, and we walked out of the restaurant in silence. No one even seemed to notice our departure. As soon as we got to the parking lot, Harry took off her shoes and tossed me the keys to the Lexus. Find us a better meal, she said, and with that, we set off in search of a more satisfying meal. Twenty minutes later, we arrived at Wiley's Hillbilly's restaurant. Each of us ate a full portion of ribs and washed them down with cold beer. She seemed to be partial to Tabasco sauce. We both pushed aside the French fries that came with our dish. We eagerly put on the bibs that came with the dish. While we were eating, I couldn't help but notice something unusual. Her evening dress had long sleeves, unlike other women in the restaurant who mostly had short sleeves or none at all. Despite this, she remained barefoot and did not seem at all embarrassed by it. The evening soon returned to normal and I had a nice time with Harry, despite the lack of intimacy. Our relationship at the gym continued as usual. Three weeks later, Harry needed an escort to another event and I agreed to accompany her. I felt it necessary to inform my boss about the situation, but he found it funny and said that I didn't need to ask for time off, it was enough to leave a note. 
he made it clear to me that I have to manage my own time. Harry's workouts at the gym were intense, with daily heavy loads. She had a high pulse and profuse sweating and was always fully clothed. While most of the women in the gym wore sweatshirts and shorts, Harry preferred hoodies and long trousers, and this choice puzzled me, but I decided not to ask questions. Our second night was similar to the first, except for the lack of food and more alcohol. With the increase in the amount of alcohol she drank, unwanted suitors began to pay more attention to her, each of whom approached her with a fresh drink. I spent the evening collecting and throwing away unnecessary glasses. One of the most irritable guys has finally crossed the line in a relationship with me. I pulled him aside and calmly warned him that if he tried to molest my fiancé again, I would deal with him. He immediately disappeared for the rest of the evening, like many other scoundrels. I didn't think I could be so intimidating. After the event, we decided to eat sushi but ended up spending $40 to buy sashimi. It was a pleasant, friendly evening. Two days later, Harry caught me off guard while I was exercising. Why did you say we were engaged? She asked, surprising me. Yesterday, I was a little embarrassed when one of my work colleagues asked me about it. She didn't wait for an answer but smiled. I called Laura. She said Donna was avoiding her and Linda. All Laura knew was that Donna traveled a lot and that people regularly stayed at the house. I asked if her mother had filed for divorce, but she didn't know anything. He and Linda hadn't spoken in weeks. For some reason, I got angry the more bottles I emptied, the worse it got. The next day, I went to the post office and sent 74 valve rods to Glenn Simpson, Donna's boss at Gilbert Industries, in a flat box. I added a short note, thanking him for a wonderful evening. Although it had been over a year since the party, I was sure he remembered it. I skipped gym classes that day because I didn't want to work out with a hangover. Later, Harry scolded me, but I assured her that I would explain everything during our next dinner together. That evening, she picked me up at 6 o'clock. Harry treated me to a great dinner. It was the first time a woman had paid for me. I made sure to dress nicely for the occasion. Throughout the evening, she listened attentively to me without making any judgments. I returned to my apartment just in time for the start of the work shift the next day at the gym. Harry had another question for me. She asked if I knew anyone who had been at the cottage the night before. When I replied that I had the names and addresses of everyone present, her eyes sparkled with interest. After training, she came to my house, and I handed her an envelope with 12 documents for the car. She pulled me to her and kissed me on the cheek. There are 15 different types of lawyers, and Harry turned out to be a crime lawyer. She tried to clarify the situation, but I just grinned and asked about the possible cost of services. Instead of answering, she gave me another peck on the cheek. Three days later, my daughter Linda called me. Donna contacted her to find out about my whereabouts. There were problems at Donna's job, and she found herself in the middle of things, urgently needing my guidance. Linda held herself in check and refused to give her any information. I was curious how Glenn felt when he received these valve rods. After informing Harry that I would pick her up in 20 minutes, I headed to her office, located in an upscale shopping mall. The office was decorated with taste without excessive extravagance. Harry had never seen my challenger before, as we had never discussed whether I had a car. When I pulled up, the hum of the engine attracted the attention of several curious onlookers. From her office, I greeted Harry with a smile as I opened the door for her, and she laughed at the sight of me. Impressive, William, very impressive, she said approvingly. Are you implying that you want an engagement ring now? I asked with a laugh. Let's not rush things, everything will be in its own time, she said, winking at me. I managed to hold off my opponent until we reached the Tennessee River. Then I decided to give her the opportunity to show her true potential. The track in the direction of Huntsville is a great road to drive but not ideal for demonstration. We reached the land of dreams in just two hours. William, everyone who was in the cottage that night took care of themselves today. She began the conversation. What do you mean by taking care of? I asked in disbelief. This is a legal term, meaning that we have filed charges. I studied your situation and came to the conclusion that you did not deserve such treatment from your wife and her colleagues. She replied. Does that really happen? I muttered. It seems that all the necessary categories have been met. 
their behavior was deliberate, extreme, and caused you severe emotional distress. Since we filed a lawsuit for only $100,000, the insurance companies advised them to simply pay this amount and avoid public litigation. It was covered by their insurance, so it wasn't a big personal loss for them, she added. Are you saying that we can get some money out of this? I exclaimed in surprise. William, I've already received three checks, perhaps another one is on the way, she said happily. Do you think Donna has already been fired? I asked. I think so, said Harry. Will this affect my divorce process? I asked another question. Have you applied yet? She asked. No, I haven't served yet. I was going to ask you to help me with this, I replied. Harry smiled broadly. William, pack a small bag and get the car ready. We're going on a trip to visit your wife. We will leave early on Thursday morning, she said happily. I couldn't help but smile at the thought. We left at 6 o'clock in the morning. After checking into the hotel until 10 hours later, I decided to call Linda and arrange with Donna and Laura to join us for lunch at the Red Lobster the next day. The conversation at lunch was a little awkward as we carefully selected dishes from the menu and ended up spending more than we had planned. However, we didn't mind because it was the first meeting in a long time. Our conversation was difficult and laconic as we both avoided discussing the boiling problems and did not want to spoil the evening. We had been in a platonic relationship for over a year now, and I was determined to make her feel comfortable. The evening turned out to be much less difficult than we had feared. We were a little out of it, but we coped with it and achieved the desired result. Donna seemed relieved that I wasn't disgusting, and I was pleased that it wasn't as terrible as she had imagined. We were both happy and satisfied. The next morning, we had a leisurely breakfast with Donna and the girls. I was wearing one of my new jackets paired with a dark turtleneck, and I felt confident in my outfit. Harry, on the other hand, was dressed in a light business suit that radiated lightness but at the same time professionalism. While my wife and daughters looked at me in awe, I introduced them to Harriet Parker, my confidant and lawyer. It was a somewhat awkward moment, but it was the best I could handle. No sooner had we started small talk than the waiter came over to order us drinks. I refused, not feeling hungry at the moment. Do you mind if I have a coffee? Donna spoke first, breaking the awkward silence at the table. I quickly looked around and saw that everyone was nodding in agreement. Why don't you bring us five cups of coffee and leave the pot on the table? I suggested to the waiter, who nodded in response. I'm glad to know that you're doing well, Bill. Do you want to tell us what you've been doing for the last year? Donna asked with a sly smile. I was just working and giving you the opportunity to find yourself or whatever you're doing, I replied, teasing her. Harry nudged me under the table, signaling me to shut up. I was counting on you, but I was abandoned, Donna said angrily. Maybe you were looking for help, but not from me, I replied angrily. Mom, Dad, please stop. I doubt very much that you arranged this meeting to quarrel, Laura said. Dad, what is the purpose of our gathering? Linda asked in a tone that brooked no objections. It was obvious that this meeting would not last long. I didn't know what to do next. I asked Harry for advice, but she ignored me and took the conversation into her own hands. Harry reached into her purse and took out an envelope. She passed it across the table to Donna. Mrs. Smith, this is a divorce petition. I think you'll find it very fair. I advise you to take it to your lawyer so he can examine it, Harry said. Laura and Linda looked at each other in amazement. It was obvious that they hadn't expected this. Donna smiled broadly. She didn't take the envelope from Harry but reached under the table and took one of them out of her purse. You're a fool. I divorced you eight months ago for running away, she replied. Donna stood up abruptly with anger in her eyes and left. Harry and I laughed together and asked the waiter to bring the menu. Lunch with Harry, Laura, and Linda was pleasant, but I couldn't help feeling a little detached. It has always been difficult for me to understand women. The girls exchanged numbers and promised to keep in touch. After that, we returned to the room to pack our things. Harry was surprised when I said that we would stay one more night, just not in this place. We packed up quickly, and an hour and a half later, we were in Elkton, Maryland. Half an hour later, Harry Parker turned into Harry Smith. 
we decided not to continue the journey but to stay overnight in Lay, Virginia. We found a house with a garage for three cars to live happily. The girls mentioned that Donna was furious when she found out that I had received $2 million from Gilbert Industries. As a result, Donna moved to Iowa, and I have a feeling that this has something to do with the missed opportunity to get these $2 million. To be honest, I may not be the sharpest and most observant person, but don't dwell on it. It took me a while to figure out what was going on behind my back, and now that I've realized it, I could use some help determining my next steps. Story 2 Greetings, everyone. My name is Simon. I have a lot of interesting things to say about my life, but I guess I'll start with my high school days. I was a mediocre student back then. I was a good student, but I didn't have a purpose in life, and I didn't have any good friends. For a long time I tried to nail my anchor to this or that shore, but the attempts to become a companionable guy did not bring me any fruit. Perhaps it was precisely because of this condition that I developed a little affliction resembling depression. In order to get rid of all the negative thoughts that tormented me, I tried to have an affair. I even had, conditionally chosen, a victim, a classmate named Ruth. This girl sympathized with me quite a bit, and sometimes even reciprocated my jokes or short conversations that arose. Such responsiveness won my heart. For some time I even felt as if I loved Ruth. It was these reflections that prompted me to make my first move. I tried to establish communication between us, to spend more time together. Luckily Ruth didn't stop me from talking to her. It wasn't even a month before we started dating. We had our first sex. Our relationship began to get more serious, except I didn't want it to. I came to the conclusion that I didn't love her after all. The relationship with my first girlfriend ended after a couple of months. She was quite a gossip, so the negative rumors about me had already spread the day of the breakup. It didn't take much intelligence on Ruth's part to accuse an unsociable schoolboy of violence and rudeness. I took the blow for granted, for it was almost impossible to change my situation. There was still a year and a half of school ahead of me. Somehow I was able to come to terms with my reputation. I can't say that it spoiled my life very much, because after a couple of weeks it was back to normal and my school acquaintances resumed contact with me. But there was still a residue on my mind. I no longer wanted to annoy my psychological state with ridiculous relationships. Time passed, I had changed a lot. After graduating high school, I moved to a big city where no one knew me at all. Ruth, along with the rest of the school gossip girls, remained somewhere far away, practically vanished from my life. At first my parents were very worried about me and were not supportive of my move. But I behaved persistently enough, so gradually I was able to change their decision. Moreover, I was not just leaving, but to study at a prestigious university. No matter how distressed my family was, my new mature life began. I couldn't afford to rent an apartment, so I moved into a guy's dorm. It wasn't easy to live there, there were often strange student meetings, but I didn't have a choice. The room looked disgusting, so I had to fix it up. But my roommate John turned out to be quite a nice and charming man in my opinion. Despite the fact that I studied medicine and he studied law, we were able to find common ground. You could say I was the quiet one and he was the son of rich parents. We liked to talk about many topics, discussing our studies and various social affairs. But we also couldn't avoid discussing girls. John was very surprised that I was very passive when it came to relationships or intimate moments. Simon, you surprise me. Sometimes I feel like you're from another planet. What is it, John? No, don't tell me. I'm afraid to hear again some stereotypical nonsense that doesn't describe my inner or outer world in any way. Have you really only had one sexual partner in your entire life? I just can't believe it. I've only just turned 20. Am I really that old to be ashamed of that? Whatever. John loudly exclaimed. You don't understand me. How many have you had? I'm very curious. Thirty? Probably a hundred. You're lying. No way. No way. I'd think about that if I were you. I couldn't believe what he was saying for a long time. I thought that number was too much. But John kept telling me that his words were completely true. When I asked how exactly he was finding them, my roommate explained his tactic with a nonchalant face. Simon, 
believe me, it's very easy to get a girl into bed. Every time I do it, I use a tactic that's been tried and tested. I go to a bar in the evening, look for an attractive member of the opposite sex, and then I just sit down with her and get acquainted. Don't they turn you down? I asked, though after a couple of seconds I realized how ridiculous that question was. John was a rich kid with Rolexes on his wrist, and he also had a very attractive appearance. Of course, they might say no. However, most of the time it goes smoothly, because why else would single girls go to a bar in the evening? I think it's pretty obvious. Got it. Why don't you come out with me tonight? I don't think that. Come on. I didn't feel like resisting, so I said yes. Just know that I'm not going out with you tonight for carnal pleasure. I just want to do an experiment to see if what you said was true. We both laughed. Our mood had not changed in the evening. I liked having fun with John, so I was willing to go along with any adventure. At the bar we sat down with two young girls. They received us quite cordially at their table. Most of the attention was directed to John. However, his charisma was transferred to me, because no matter what silly thing I said, the girls continued to burst into tinkling laughter. John chose a gaggle of blondes, who kept trying to find out what he did for a living. I got the second girl. Surprisingly, she was very quiet and attentive. Of course, I didn't think about her spiritual qualities at the time, since the priority in such meetings was her attractive appearance. This girl's phone was imposing, but within the norm. I liked her blue eyes and hair a lot, too. But as soon as she introduced herself, I almost immediately forgot her name. It was decided that I would learn it a little later. Ladies, it's so late. Why don't we all stay in a hotel tonight? John asked. His sly smile looked very tempting. I doubted it would work at first, but surprisingly they were quick to take him up on his offer. We rented one room with two bedrooms and got down to business. It actually turned out to be quite easy. The girl I went to the hotel with was quite gentle and pleasant. In the morning I woke up in the arms of my partner, whose name I didn't know at all. Trying to get up unnoticed, I accidentally touched her shoulder. She was awake, and for some reason I felt uncomfortable leaving her. As I got dressed, I wanted to know this stranger's name. What's your name? I'm Clara. That's a very pretty name. What's yours? Simon. Maybe you want something for breakfast? I started to ask, but I was interrupted by a loud female snore. Apparently it was John's girlfriend. It took two seconds, and we started laughing out loud. I'm sorry, Clara, but your girlfriend is a real tractor. It's like her snoring makes the roof go up. I know. Sometimes when we sleep in the same room, I have to cover my ears with something. But she's funny. That's about how our conversation began. Clara and I talked exactly until the other couple woke up. We must have hit it off, because she left me her number before she left. A few days passed, and I wanted to call her. It was a pleasure talking to her. It turned out that our taste in music and literature was very similar. We arranged to meet again, but in the afternoon. I was able to learn a lot of interesting things about Clara. It turned out that she was a few years older than me. She was studying at a pedagogical university and was going to be an elementary school teacher. On the whole, she turned out to be a very smart and quick-witted girl, which couldn't help but please. We got on in such a way that she came to my dorm a couple of times. John recognized her right away, though he wasn't very positive about her. Except, even so, the three of us were able to get along. What happened was that we became best friends. There was definitely a connection between the three of us. We had a lot of fun. A couple of years later I married Clara, only it didn't affect our friendship in any way. John still spent a lot of time with us. The only thing that stressed us out was that he didn't want to end his hobby with women. In 10 years, his collection numbered somewhere around 500 sexual partners. It was both shocking and admirable. But Clara and I maintained monogamy, so we were able to build a strong foundation for our relationship. We didn't like children, so we weren't going to have any. But we did have an adorable dog and a very cute cat. Life was going well and smoothly. We didn't have very much money but I worked at one of the most prestigious universities in the country, which allowed me to become wealthy. 
Of course, John was swimming in gold, but we weren't poor either. The three of us liked to drink expensive wine on our summer terrace or in our little peach orchard. This was how our prosperous life went, but one day an incident happened that turned everything upside down. I received a phone call and was told words I will never forget again. John is dead. I am truly sorry for your loss. This loss had a very negative impact on my life and Clara's. We had known him for so long that we just couldn't believe he was dead. He was a close friend to us. At first, his parents hid the cause of their son's death. However, we did manage to find out that John had died of AIDS. We weren't very surprised, since this guy had sex with so many people. It's possible that he wasn't even using protection. Clara was very sad about this. His fate seemed so unfair that my wife became apathetic. I understood her, I felt about the same way. But time passed, and after a year we were able to adjust to such a loss. But this time new problems began. My wife got a lung infection, pneumocystis pneumonia to be exact. It was a big blow to our family. I was worried about my Clara, because there wasn't much I could do. Pretty soon we got the bad news again. Sorry, but you have HIV. It's what has affected your health so badly, the doctor said to Clara and then turned to me. Most likely you also have the infection. Get tested. We were frightened. I was very worried about my wife, but I soon realized what it was all about. I didn't feel sorry for her, because the infection was all her fault. I knew right away that she had cheated on me with our best friend. You cheated on me? Just be honest. I, it's so silly now. Speak! I shouted. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. It was just one time. I couldn't help it, Clara excused herself. But her apology was worthless to me, because I was also sick. The situation just shocked me. The two closest people in my life had cheated on me. And probably had done it many times. But why didn't Clara confess to me a year after John died that she had slept with him? Perhaps if she had warned me, her illness would not have reached this form. Fortunately, medicine advances every day, and such illnesses are no longer a sentence. But Clara had brought her body to such a horror that it simply began to burn with pneumonia. I was shattered and destroyed. I wanted to part with my wife as soon as possible, but I could not, for the prognosis of her health was very unfortunate. I had to lie that I had forgiven her, so that she could continue to live out her last weeks in peace. Clara died about a month later in the hospital. This event left a huge imprint on me, for this woman was the love of my life. It seemed that nothing would ever be the same again. But I was also very angry, for I had become a victim of her vile deception. Her horrible condition I could not rejoice in. But when thoughts of vengeance crossed my mind, I immediately remembered her last days, when she had been suffocating all day, asking me for help. She fully deserved it, for we choose our own fate. I never insulted her or humiliated her. She had no good reason to start cheating on me. My late friend also acted like a real jerk. However, that was to be expected. I should have known from the beginning that he was not a conscientious guy. His fondness for erratic sex was worth noting. The only thing that comforted me was that I wasn't over him yet. Fortunately, I was able to adjust and live a full life. I regularly took various medications, but that was nothing compared to my wife's death throes. Society was sympathetic to my problem. So after a couple of years I was able to find a wife. She turned out to be a very good and bright person, because she was able to accept me with all my shortcomings, including my dangerous illness. Life gradually began to get better. Together with my new wife, we adopted a boy who had the same disease as I did. The only difference was that he was born that way. We became a very good happy family. As the years went by, life didn't stop. I could finally talk about my feelings again. I love you, I told my wife and adopted son.